Today, I will be interviewing Pat Ellis. She is one of the Eagle Forum of Alabama board members, and she has really been digging into some educational issues over the last year. And what we want to talk about today is called critical race theory. Is it in our schools in Alabama, our K through 12 schools? And we, we're just going to get a good overview of all of that. So, Pat, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Becky. I've been looking forward to it. So do you want to start with a YouTube video to get us going? Yes, let's do that. I think it gives people a good idea of what's going on and, and really uh, the broad variety of people that are against it. Okay, great. So stand by and we'll play this for you. I come out of an academic uh, institution, and uh, this is a, something that academics debate, what is the role of race and so forth. And, and let me be very clear. I grew up in segregated Birmingham, Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't go to a movie theater or to a restaurant with my parents. I went to segregated schools till we moved to Denver. Mm -hmm. My parents never thought I was going to grow up in a world without prejudice, but they also told me that's somebody else's problem, not yours. You're going to overcome it, and you are going to be anything you want to be. And that's the message that I think we ought to be sending to kids. One of the worries that I have about the way that we're, we're talking about race is that it either seems so big that somehow white people now have to feel guilty for everything that happened in the past. I, I mm -hmm. don't think that's very productive. Or black people have to feel disempowered by mm -hmm. race. I would like black kids to be completely empowered to know that they are beautiful in their blackness. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, I don't have to make white kids feel bad for being white. So somehow this is a conversation that has gone in the wrong direction. Have you heard about critical race theory? I'm guessing you probably have. It has already insinuated itself into many institutions and is making rapid progress into others. If it takes hold, it will completely change the very nature of America and the way you live. Critical race theory holds that the most important thing about you is your race. The color of your skin, that's who you are. Not your behavior, not your values, not your environment. Your race. In critical race theory, if you are a member of a minoritized racial group, their term, not mine, you are a victim of a system that is rigged against you, a system that doesn't want you to succeed. On the other hand, if your race is privileged, you're an exploiter, whether you intend to be or not. Critical race theory begins from the assumption that racism occurs in all interactions. To see how this works, consider this thought experiment. Imagine you own a shop and two customers enter at the same time, one white and one black. Who do you help first? If you help the black person first, critical race theory would say you did so because you don't trust black people to be left alone in your store. That's racist. If you help the white person first instead, Critical race theory would say you did so because you think blacks are second-class citizens. That's racist, too. That's critical race theory. It can find racism in anything, even if it has to read your mind to do it. Critical race theory is a uniquely American invention. Brewed up at Harvard Law School in the 70s, now part of the academic and media mainstream, it is also uniquely un-American because it rejects the core tenets of the American, classically liberal Judeo-Christian value system. It turns the bedrock American idea upside down. Here it is in the words of Richard Delgado and Jean Stefanczyk, two leading proponents. Critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, and the neutral principles of constitutional law. It does this because critical race theory proponents assume racism is present everywhere and always, and they look for it critically until they find it. And they always find it. It has to be there because that's how the imperial European powers and then America set things up. Here, as in all dangerous academic theories, there is a kernel of truth. Human beings were not preoccupied with race until the 16th century, when Europeans began to explore and then colonize other parts of the world. Drawing distinctions between the races reached its peak in the 19th century with the widespread use of slave labor in North and South America. No one denies this. But since then, the Western world, and most especially America, has spent a lot of time, money, and blood breaking free of its racist past. It's been a rocky road for sure, but great progress has been made. Critical race theory says all this progress is a mirage. 
Racism never died, never even faded a little bit. It just hid itself better. Critical race theory, therefore, is not a continuation of the civil rights movement. It is, in fact, a repudiation of it. To critical race theorists, Martin Luther King was both wrong and naive. White Americans can never judge blacks by the content of their character. They can only judge them, always unfavorably, consciously, or unconsciously, by the color of their skin. Ironically, not since the Aryan obsession in Germany in the 1930s and 1940s, or South African apartheid in the second half of the 20th century, has the social movement been so obsessed with race. Critical race theory is then, in a very real sense, a counter-American revolution. But that's a positive, not a negative, to those who subscribe to the theory. The American experiment was given a 400-year tryout, and it doesn't work. So let's scrap it. That's what they believe. Is that what you believe? I'm going to guess that most of you don't. So how do we stop critical race theory before it infects the brains of too many decent Americans, especially young people, and turns us into something we have never been and shouldn't ever want to be? The answer is simple. Refuse to accept it. Don't be intimidated by the heads-I-win, tails-you-lose logic of this self-destructive, America-hating, anti-reality idea. Don't be bullied into thinking that you're racist when you know you're not, or that you're a victim when you know you're not. Defend yourself while you still can. I'm James Lindsay, founder of New Discourses for Prager University. If you noticed in the uh, video, um, the second video, I believe, that uh, the names Delgado and Stefanik were mentioned. And Richard Delgado was a professor at the University of Alabama along with his wife. Now they are considered, or he is considered one of the founders of critical race theory. And he was actually hired by the University of Alabama in 2013. So we know that there were hundreds and hundreds of students that went through his classroom that were indoctrinated in this ideology. And you know, think about it, Becky, how would you like to go before a judge who was trained in Delgado's critical race theory. Uh, it's really disturbing. And this is happening all across the country. He left uh, the University of Alabama this past year and he's now in Seattle. What is driving CRT? Really, you know, the ideology, of course, uh, since it's been in our universities for so long, there are people that uh, have been indoctrinated at this point, but there's so much money involved, Becky. It's, it's amazing the kind of money that's being made. Uh, for example, <clears throat> one of the, uh, I guess the best well-known is Panora Panorama Education. And Panorama, the um, son-in-law of Mar Merrick Garland, our US Attorney General, was one of the co-founders. And um, they have the backing of the Zuckerbergs, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife. Um, they also um, charge, it was, I think the, in Loudoun County, Virginia, they charge $625 per hour to train teachers. I think they foot the bill for over $52,000 just for you know, training teachers in one year. So there's that. And then of course we have a new generation of race hustlers. You know, uh, People that have taken the place of um, Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson. We now have Ember X. Kendi and we have Nicole Hannah-Jones. And um, uh, let's see, there's one, oh, um, well, Al Sh Sharp, well, Richard Delgado, I mentioned him already. Those are just a few that are making uh, lots of money off of this. So some people may watch this and say, well, CRT, I mean, it's not really that pervasive. It's, it's only in some places. What would you say to that? Well, Becky, we know it's in the university, of course, and we also know now that it's, uh, in our military institutions, it's in government agencies. You know, the corporate woke um, agenda is now in a lot of companies. Uh, people are having to be go through the DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings. But lately, um, you know, it's trickled down even to toddlers. And I wanna show the viewers three of the books, toddler books. This first one is called A is for Activists. And 83% of the people that bought this on Amazon gave it a five-star review. Uh, and one of the mothers commented, you can make sure your precious baby adopts victim status. And um, the Z in this book 
is Z for Zapatista, and he was a Mexican revolutionary. Uh, the next book is Anti-Racist Baby. This book had over 9,000 reviews, and one mother mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, as a mother of a biracial children, I'm all about inclusion, but this book is a true abomination. Hmm. And this book is by Imbram X. Kendi. You know, we talked about him earlier. The last one is Woke Baby. And this one says, like a good revolutionary, you never sleep. This one had 81% of Amazon reviewers giving it a five-star review. So it's really an indoctrination of toddlers now. Yes. And, you know, I, my, I was going to say it, you know, the beginning of this discussion was a lot about it's being taught in the colleges and that's a little bit different. I mean, it's terrible as it is, but we're talking, you're showing books that are for preschoolers. Absolutely. This, this is very pervasive mm -hmm. throughout our culture and what we're seeing in the schools. Do you have specific examples of, well, those are specific examples right there. Um, in Alabama, what are you hearing from teachers or from students? Are they being race hustled in the schools? Absolutely. I have quite a few examples from the state of Alabama. Uh, the first one was out of Home, Homewood City School System, the first one I'll mention. And a father reported that um, a heritage panel visited his son's 10th grade classroom. A what kind of panel? A heritage panel. Okay. And um, I don't know what that is exactly. Uh, the Heritage Panel is made up of students. Uh, they're supported by Alquest Collaborative. Alquest Collaborative uh, is a nonprofit. It's in Birmingham. And I think the people that started it had their hearts in the right place. Their son was tragically murdered and they wanted to do something. But, you know, um, in my opinion, by making other races feel bad is not the, the way to handle this. Uh, this young man at Homewood School, uh, he was listening and about halfway through, he raised his hand and he said, are you saying that whites cannot be discriminated against? And the, uh, the classroom kind of broke into two sides. One side said, yes, they can. One side said, no, they cannot. Well, the teacher sided with the class, the, uh, class position that whites could not be discriminated against. She told this young man that he could go to the library if he wasn't happy with the discussion. And she called him part of the dominant group. Yeah. Uh, then we also have um, No Place for Hate, which is in um, Mountain Brook Schools and in about, I think in all Madison or Huntsville City Schools. And the uh, Anti-Defamation League, they define racism as the marginalization and or oppression of people of color based on socially constructed racial hierarchy that privileges white people. Now, Jonathan Hay, <clears throat> excuse me, is a professor or psychologist at New York University. And as you know, that is no bastion of biblical worldview or conservative values. And he states this, no place for hate and similar programs are more likely to produce anger, anxiety, and hopelessness. Traits that are rapidly rising among today's youth. Um, now the Mountain Brook school system, they train their teachers in no place for hate. The parents got wind of that. The, the last I heard, they had put a stop to it. So, you know, that's not an issue there anymore. In the Jasper City school system, a teacher showed elementary school students a Black Lives Matter video. Mm -hmm. Mother got wind of it and she did approach the principal. The principal did put an end to it. So she was pleased with the way he handled it. Now in Selma City Schools, they teach equity, social justice, and restorative justice. And let me just read a portion of a memo from the superintendent. And, and this is Selma City Schools? This is Selma City Schools. Okay. She says, as the leader of Selma City Schools, a black woman and a mother, I believe in the movement Black Lives Matter. I believe in anti-racism. I believe in racial equity and justice. On behalf of our school district, we are outraged by the systems that have allowed countless black men and women to be killed at the hands of police. We want to ensure that our scholars, families and the Selma community 
understand that Team Selma supports our teachers. Acknowledging racism and the ideology of white supremacy is a step in the right direction. Clark Elementary School will open this fall as Clark Social Justice Academy. All of our school leaders are beginning to research restorative justice and Selma City Schools is embracing restorative practices as part of our student discipline procedures. RB Hudson Academy has paved the way for the work. Hudson and Selma, Hudson and Selma High both hosted numerous restorative justice circles during the last school year. So Becky, what we're looking at is a whole system, school system that is teaching kids basically to have a chip on their shoulder and to paint with a broad brush all the Selma police you know, uh, officers, yes. which I think is very dangerous. And uh, I sure wouldn't wanna be married to a Selma police officer with that kind of attitude coming out of the schools. Um, and another thing, and then uh, we can move on. Uh, you may be familiar with Howard Zinn. He's a socialist historian who wrote the textbook, A People's History of the United States. Revisionist it, history. Revisionist history, exactly. And it is used in some Alabama schools. And I mention him because he has, he's deceased now, but he started something called the Zen Education Project. And teachers sign the pledge when they sign the pledge. They agree that structural racism is the defining character of our society today, and that they will continue teaching based on critical race theory, even if it is banned by law. Now, 12 teachers have said in Alabama, have said that they would continue to teach even if it is banned by law. And I know that we're gonna put this on the EVA Forum of Alabama website, so we can post those names and uh, the schools, or excuse me, the cities they live in on the website. Actually, I will put that in the link below. Okay, okay, great. And then the, the last one, and this is sad, a, a family moved from California and they homeschooled the entire time when they were in California. So they felt like coming to the Bible Belt, Alabama, they would be safe putting their children in Alabama schools. Well, I think it was the, first, the second day of school, uh, the teacher had um, a Black Lives Matter poster with the raised black fist. And she told the students that they were all brainwashed for saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Mm. That they had been brainwashed since kindergarten. Now, I'm assuming that means that she uh, thinks they're brainwashed because we have a racist country. And why would you want to pledge allegiance to a racist country? Mm -hmm. And there are many more, but I think that gives your audience a good idea of you know, just how much is going on in Alabama schools. Well, that reminds me, I, I want to bring up one more thing in when parents want to think about what is happening in their, is it happening in their schools? This is a good discussion to have with their children, but a lot of schools are doing what they call a privilege walk or a privilege circle. And basically what that is, is they line all the kids up on a line on the floor, everybody's lined up. And then they'll say, if you came from a family with uh, a mom and a dad take a step forward. If you only have one mom and, and no dad, take a step back. If you are white, take two steps forward. If you're not, take a step back. And they, they go through all of these different ways to segregate people or differentiate between people that have nothing to do with their character. It's all about things that, well, a lot of times it's just about the color of their skin, but what happens at the end of this privilege circle is all those that are white and especially those who have a mom and dad at home and all of that, they're supposed to look back at those behind them and basically say, because they're at the head of the line because they have privilege because they're mm -hmm. white and all those behind are the victims. And it's your fault that you're at the front of the line, why they have it bad back behind you. And I'm shocked but this is happening. This is happening in church youth groups. Mm -hmm. So parents, you need to be aware, ask your kids if they've ever participated in a privilege walk. And it would have been with someone who was a teacher over them or a leader over them, having them do this. I think that's really important for people to pay attention. And Becky, you know, they fail to realize that there are some white children that are born with alcoholic parents. They're born in poverty. 
Uh, you know, not everyone has privilege just because of the, the color of their skin. I mean, look at um, the Obama children. Now, would you say that they're oppressed? I don't think so. You know, it's just ridiculous. And it's sad how we're dividing children. We're planting a seed that wasn't there. Uh, just to give you one example, I've got an eighth grade uh, granddaughter, just sweet as she can be. And she was excited to have her eighth, uh, eight-year-old birthday party. And uh, the little girls got out of the car. She just had her three best friends. Well, two of them were little black girls. Well, if they had been raised with these books, if those mothers had raised those children with these books, that party wouldn't have happened with those children. And it really makes me sad how the adults are pushing this on children. It, it's really unconscionable. It really is. I know uh, you see a lot of this in the high school, even junior high age, where they have bought into the lie that this country is systemically racist, meaning from its very found, founding through all the parts of our country, it's racially systemic or systemically racist. What would you say to that? Well, we know the Jim Crow laws are long gone. Yeah. And that was that was a blight on our history. And we yeah. all accept that. You know, no one, no one uh, doubts that slavery was an evil. And, and it's, you know, thank God, long gone. But we have to remember, you know, we have the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. We have the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We had affirmative action. We have in our laws done what we can to, uh, you know, end that type of um, treatment of people of color. And I think if you look around at what's happened in the United States, if you look at the entertainment industry, there are many black entertainers successful. You look at sports, you look at government, look at how many mayors of uh, large cities are black. You or or non-white. Or yes. non-white, yeah, they can be Hispanic. Um, and then you look at Barack Obama, twice elected president. Does a, a country that's systemically racist, you know, do that twice? Then you've got people like um, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, You've got um, Ben Carson, you know, many members of the cabinet have been black. Yes. They have, uh, you know, positions of authority throughout our government on the state, uh, national and local level. Yes. So we, I think that is a false argument and it's an argument being pushed by these race hustlers to keep us divided. Yes. And when you look at the amount of businesses that are owned, um, people of color, it, it is so much bigger now. And then also you look at interracial marriages. Oh, absolutely. And it is just has skyrocketed and it shows that we are, we are past that. We have come through that, but now all of a sudden they're wanting us to go back into that. This is the Marxist tactic. Instead of using um, the economic status to divide people, they're using color and it's, it's horrible. So what do we do about this, Pat? Well, you know, I would love for there to be hearings on the state level. There's, uh, I know you're familiar with Carol Swain, Dr. Carol Swain. She has a program called Unity Training Solutions. There are probably others, but I think these programs need to be investigated. And what they do is they um, train people and teach people to, uh, you know, in our common humanity and to work together as teams and to uh, respect the individual for, you know, that person, their character. Um, and really the children of today, like I gave you the example of my, my uh, little granddaughter, they don't see color. Mm -hmm. And that video, the, you know, one of the videos prior to our speaking, you know, the dad and the little girl, I mean, it's just heartwarming that video, how they talk about, you know, judging people and how they love people. And it has nothing to do with color. So um, it's shameful this is going on. It really hurts me because we have a great country. We have wonderful children coming up that want to love each other. And the adults in the room, so to speak, they're the ones who are destroying that. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for your time today. And we will definitely revisit this because as more investigating goes on within our school system. I know that you have recruited a lot of people to start paying attention. A lot of parents are getting involved. I know we're going to need to come back and talk about this more of 
different things you've found and maybe some of the ways that we are able to push back on this. And I want to let everyone know they can go to alabamaeagle.org. And when you go to our issues tab at the top, click on that and you'll find CRT. And we've got some really good resources there um, to help you fight back and take your, you know, protect your families from this. So well, thank, thank you so for being much, with Becky. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Okay, Have great. a good day.